now. Um, so, all right, so this is the uh, first um, um, ramp wide finding here, uh, the uh, incorrect period of uh, risk assessment. Um, this has been a, a discuss quite a bit of a discussion involved in this in this proceeding as well as the uh, ramp proceeding. Uh, but safety policy divisions um, assumption or position as well as uh, our uh, we conferred with energy division on this. But the the risk mitigation proposed in the ramp are for programs that are intended to be proposed in the utilities upcoming general increase. So the ramp analysis, including the risk spend efficiency values, are meant to help commissioners, commission staff, and parties assess whether utilities are targeting the right risks with appropriate cost mitigations. One of the purposes of ramp is to inform the upcoming GRC with key information to help commissions, staff, and parties determine the utilities' future revenue requirements. SEMPRA's upcoming GRC will cover test year 2024 and attrition years 2025 through 2027. Thus, we consider this to be the GRC period of review uh, that is uh, referenced in the settlement agreement. So for this, uh, for this issue, uh, Safety Policy Division recommends that uh, the SEMPRA companies identify the risk mitigation programs and projects they anticipate will continue between 2024 and 2027 and estimate the benefits of those proposed expenditures in light of the anticipated risk reductions that have or will have occurred up to that point. Next slide, please. Uh, the next major ramp finding, um, and we can talk about all these things uh, in the in the Q and I imagine there's going to be some discussion of that in the in the Q and A. So we'll just uh, go through these findings and then we'll discuss these issues in the in the Q and A. The next uh, uh, major finding was uh, an excessive implied value of statistical life. So. Uh, th this is not a new issue to this ramp. The issue of high imputed values for avoided serious injuries and fatalities were raised by TURN and MGRA in the pg e ramp and again here in the uh, uh, SEMPRA ramp. Uh, the settlement agreement uh, it requires a minimum weighting of 40% uh, of the safety att attribute and SEMPRA opted for a 60% weight. And uh, the multi-attribute value function framework provides substantial flexibility for IOUs to modify weights and scales to suit utilities' desired consequence valuations to justify proposed expenditures. But as we noted in the SBD evaluation, those choices uh, should reflect uh, reasonable um, assumptions and consequence uh, values. In, the, uh, in their comments, TURN cited the uh, US Department of Transportation value of statistical life at $11.6 million as a uh, reference point um, and um, they suggested that SEMPRA change their uh, range uh, from 20 to 200 in order to reduce the imputed value of life to a more uh, reasonable level. SPD looked at that and then we also, for illustrative purposes, this is just to kind of point out that there's a lot of options that, that could be taken to adjust the values uh, that are uh, end up being imputed here. Uh, so SPD staff pointed out that you could also reduce the safety weight to 40% and change the range to 100 and get a similar value. 100 was chosen because it is relatively close to the number of individuals who are killed in the campfire and represents the highest death toll we have seen from the electric infrastructure related wildfire. So to adjust this, to, to deal with this issue, um, we just recommend that SEMPRA reassess their weighting and scaling uh, to produce more uh, defensible imputed valuations uh, going into the GRC. Next slide, please, Francisco. Thank you. Um, so the third major finding uh, was that the SEMPRA companies did not provide distinct lores and cores for their tranches. So the purpose of tranching is to identify subgroups of assets or systems with like characteristics. They should have internally similar risk scores that distinguish them from other assets or systems. And each tranche can have mitigation strategies according to the level of risk. SPD noted that SoCal Gas and San Diego Gas and Electric do not present tranche-specific lore and core values uh, for most of the tranches in the ramp report, but instead assign the same general pre-mitigation lore and core to all tranches in that risk chapter. A tranche should have risk scores based on its specific characteristics. Uh, there are a number of examples pointed out in the evaluation report. 
Uh, for example, two of the identified tranches in the SoCal gas medium pressure pipeline risk recognize that vintage plastic and bare steel pipe materials pose a higher risk of failure than other kinds of pipe material in the system. We would have expected these types of pipe to have a different lore than the newer or better protected pipes in the rest of the medium pressure system. Uh, another example uh, was laid out uh, with respect to the Ventura compressor station. Uh, the pre-medication lore for this uh, tranche with the Ventura compressor station in it is the same as the lore for the high pressure system as a whole. The ramp narrative describes the Ventura compressor station uh, components as nearing obsolescence uh, or about to, you know, at risk of failure. And the likelihood that the station may fail due to a broken part that cannot be replaced readily should be included in the tranche lore that is distinct from other parts of the high pressure system. Under the settlement agreement, the effects of a mitigation on the tranche are to be expressed as a change to the tranche specific pre mitigation values for lore and core. So SPD recommends for this uh, finding uh, that prior to uh, filing the G, uh, GRC, uh, SEMPRA developed tranche specific lore and core scores for each tranche to provide greater specificity and, clear, and clarity of the risk for each tranche. Uh, next slide, please, Francisco. Thank you. Uh, a related issue was the lack of granularity uh, for the uh, for each tranche. Again, the purpose of a tranche is to select a subgroup of assets with uniform but distinctly different risk scores from the remainder of the risk category. This grouping facilitates granular risk assessments and identification of corresponding specific mitigations. Finer granularity of tranches can help the utility and the commission better understand which portions of the utility system offer greater potential for effective risk reduction. As is spelled out in the report, some of the tranches could be further divided by consideration of risk factors that occur within the tranche. An example of the tranching in the high pressure pipeline into the, into the high consequence area tranche and the non-HCA tranche, each containing hundreds of miles of pipeline. The pipeline factors within each of those tranches have variable vintage wells, history of internal co corrosion, uh, and the ability to be pigged or the inability to be pigged. Uh, so you could have, SEMPRA could have divided uh, amongst uh, those tranches more granularly to reflect specific risks associated with uh, different pipes within those uh, tranches. Similarly, in the wildfire risk chapter, um, the, um, the, the risks were essentially divided into tier three and tier two groupings, uh, and it would have been um, easier for staff to evaluate the efficacy of, uh, of the uh, proposed mitigations uh, if they were, uh, the, the tranching was more granular and based on geographic, environmental, and weather variables, such as wind speeds, elevation, microclimate, uh, or other factors that identify, that would better identify and quantify meaningful differences in the risk profiles. So to help address this issue, um, SPD recommends that SEMPRA review um, the, the comments in each of the chapters, uh, as well as uh, forthcoming party comments and prior informal comments given by parties uh, to improve uh, tranching. Uh, we provided a little example here. Uh, Francisco, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is just one, uh, one of the examples. Uh, oh, prior, prior, there you go, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, to uh, help um, illustrate the issue of uh, the possibility of improving uh, tranching. Could you go back to that, um, that hockey stick shaped chart, uh, Francisco? Back a slide. There we go. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, this graph uh, depicts the high cost vintage integrity plastic plan, which will replace vintage pipe with less risky new pipes. SoCal Gas and sdg &E have identified the entirety of their vintage plastic pipe as a single tranche. However, as you can see in this, in this graph, um, risk uh, drops off precipitously um, uh, with, with some high, some pipes being uh, high risk and uh, other uh, pipes being substantially lower risk, it would be um, beneficial for risk analysis purposes uh, to um, distinguish between those pipes that are uh, higher risk than lower risks uh, within this uh, 
program, this mitigation program, uh, so we could evaluate the relative benefit of expenditures in this program compared to other uh, pipe replacement uh, efforts. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, we're saying under, this is undeveloped <laughs> satisfaction attribute. Uh, so again, uh, we applaud SEMPRA for uh, introducing a new attribute. And um, I feel like this kind of uh, attribute uh, would benefit the uh, ramp uh, process uh, and provide for opportunities for um, a better, more rich understanding of risk associated with uh, utility activities and infrastructure. Um, so it's, this is uh, obviously, they took on a pretty big challenge here. It's very difficult to quantify less tangible, uh, but important aspects of public experiences associated with risk events. Uh, so further development of this kind of metric has merit and, and should be continued. And uh, we look forward to discussing it further um, in either this proceeding or in um, uh, the SMAP proceeding. So uh, an example of how this uh, kind of attribute could be used is, you know, in the Elysium Canyon gas leak. The event did not result in immediate serious injuries and fatalities, but did cause widespread fear in the community, uh, resulted in thousands of relocations, including having to move schools and classrooms full of children to other locations. It had substantial political and regulatory reactions uh, and other significant repercussions that aren't currently captured adequately in the ramp process. So this is a good thing to continue um, uh, looking into. But all that being said, um, staff has concerns about the use of the stakeholder attribute in justifying expenditures at this point. The available data and relatively sparse justification and explanation in the ramp filing left a lot of questions uh, unanswered. Um, throughout the ramp, uh, it was at 2%, the new attribute does not have a large impact on most of the ramp risks. However, as we'll talk about later, it did have a significant impact on the electric infrastructure integrity risk, which was a relatively high ranking risk in SDG&E's uh, ramp filing. Uh, as described in the Semper Company's ramp report, this attribute and sub attributes appear to be very subjective and qualitative. And we recognize that many aspects of the attributes in the multi-attribute value function have subjective elements and qualitative evaluations based on SME judgment. However, at this time, based on the information provided, this attribute appears to lack objective measurements or sufficient explanation. This attribute is intended to measure changes in satisfaction levels uh, of the, the various attribute pieces, which is the public, customers, employees, government, and regulators. And there's a stakeholder satisfaction uh, score on a zero to 100 scale with 20 going to each uh, sub attribute. We, we, we had a lot of questions about how that was uh, decided and um, concerns about potential overlap among uh, the sub attributes and the um, and other factors within the ramp. Uh, for example, in the description of the uh, of the stakeholder satisfaction attribute, um, uh, the Semper companies uh, identified that it was pretty difficult to get regular snapshots of public opinion or measure um, public attitudes uh, about, about things. So they predominantly lie, rely on uh, subject matter expert judgments uh, to estimate the scores for, this, um, for these attributes. And they didn't really under, uh, explain um, how the assumptions and the bases for, the, for that scoring uh, in the report it was also difficult to see how they distinguish between one attribute and another. Uh, for example, there's a big overlap between customers and the public, and we couldn't tell if how those were uh, separated out. Uh, we also couldn't tell what the distinction is necessarily between government and regulators. Uh, so obviously regulators are part of the government, um, and so we couldn't see why they would each have 20 points associated uh, with them. Um, we also... Um, we're uh ben, ben, yeah. ben sorry to interrupt you you're on the wrong slide again oh i'm sorry thanks steve uh francisco if you could move ahead to uh to the next slide please sorry about that that's my bad thanks steve uh so uh the um um yeah so then the, one of the things that puzzled us also about it was how regulators got 20 points and the public got 20 points 
when it seems like in the sub attributes regulators should have a relatively small um, uh, number compared to the uh, compared to the public. So it, essentially, this is um, uh, then there's the other issue we, we saw was that uh, customer satisfaction um, is obviously uh, really wound up with uh, reliability. And we couldn't tell how the difference in the public customer satisfaction or customer uh, satisfaction in those two sub attributes was distinguished between uh, from or didn't kind of augment the reliability uh, metric um, in, in the other in the other attributes. So there's there's a lot of questions to be um, addressed in these um, in these uh, in this attribute. And so we recommend that um, we go ahead and. Uh, or the temper go ahead and, and not use it uh, for the purposes of justifying expenditures at this point. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, those were the, the main overarching findings uh, in our uh, SPD evaluation. Uh, so the next uh, portion of the presentation uh, is going to be about uh, the risk we've identified um, uh, or the risks that, that SEMPRA listed as their top priorities. Uh, so as I mentioned at the outset, we're just going to cover the uh, top three uh, for each of the um, utilities. So uh, for sdg &E, we're going to cover wildfire uh, and those related, including PSPS, electric infrastructure integrity, uh, and the high pressure uh, pipeline incidents. And for SoCal gas, we're going to cover uh, high pressure pipeline incidents um, and down to gas storage. Uh, so those top three. So for wildfire, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Arnold Sung uh, for uh, covering uh, wildfire. Francisco, if you could move it to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to take everybody through a high level overview of our recommendations for the wildfire risk modeling. Um, and if there are any questions, obviously you can Hold on to them, hopefully, until the Q&A session. <clears throat> um, so this first slide uh, simply reinforces some of the applicable ramp-wide findings that Ben had mentioned earlier. Um, and this chapter, it's, it may, it, these um, ramp-wide findings are relevant. Uh, the lack of granularity of tranches, which I'll discuss a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and then there's also the apportionment of lore and core um, that didn't really take place um, within the chapter or within the um, body of the ramp, at least the narrative. And then there's other uh, recommendations that you'll find in in the uh, about ramp evaluation, and two specifically are the endorsement of MGRA's recommendation. Um, so they provided a rec they provided a request for a scenario analysis that would provide a, a, a consequence distribution model under a power law. Probability distribution um, with a 40, I think it was a 40 billion dollar maximum um, loss. <clears throat> and they created a compelling case uh, for why uh, SDG&E should uh, reproduce their model from gamma uh, distribution model to power law. And um, I won't go into too many details here. Um, if you do have any Q&A or questions, I should say, um, Joe Mitchell is here on the call, so hopefully uh, Joe can field some of those. Or if you'd like to explain it further, um, you can do so during the Q and A session. And then there's also the smoke wildfire smoke impacts on health, which uh, we do applaud and appreciate uh, SDG's efforts. Uh, Joe had some pointed comments about the methodology, which I think make a lot of sense. So we think make a lot of sense, um, and you know this this is something that. We hope SDG can continue to can continue to work on uh, in time for the next uh, GRC filing. Uh, next slide, please. So the rest of the recommendations are mostly uh, staff recommendations, uh, and again, this is just a high level overview. The first one uh, relates to the granularity of tranches. Um, we do like that SDG carved out the tranches for tier three, tier two, and non HFTD. Uh, we also appreciate the fact that they continue to break down some of the asset differences um, based on the control and mitigation programs. Uh, what we would have liked to see in the ramp uh, report itself is more of an apples to apples comparison. Uh, so there are things like um, 
I'll just use the example of tree trimming, for instance, in terms of natural units. You, uh, SDG and E described um, the number of trees, for instance, that would uh, that would be subject to this mitigation activity, as opposed to the number of miles per se that would be affected by the tree trimming activity. And so, uh, you know, if, if everything were presented as circuit miles or in circuit miles or in circuit segments, uh, it would allow you to provide a portfolio analysis, or we could analyze the mitigations based on multiple mitigations affecting uh, certain circuit miles or circuit segments. Um, and so that would have been the preference in terms of the description. And we do know that uh, SDG E has, we do know that you've got, you guys have at least started, if not completed, um, circuit segment level of risk analysis on your 627 overhead circuit, seg uh, overhead um, circuit segments in the HFTD. And that's something we'd obviously like you to present um, in time for the next general rate case filing. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. And this is another depiction of how useful that um, breakdown of risk by circuit segments are. Now, these are just the 108 circuit segments that we were uh, provided via data request. And you can see um, roughly 80% of the risk is held by some 20% of the circuit segments in this 108 sample, obviously over 600 and 27 circuit segments, um, the, all of these might make up that, uh, all of these circuit segments you see here could make up that 80% of risk uh, uh, risk capture. But um, when you're able to break things down by the circuit segment level, you could produce quantiles, risk profiles based on quantiles, or you might be able to just target circuit segments um, in a way that everyone can understand as you move forward with mitigation activities. Next slide, please. And then we have uh, additional recommendations for SDG&E. Um, so SDG&E SDG &E did not provide uh, RSCs for foundational activities. Um, you know, you, you've, you've explained it as, as uh, essentially guesswork on, on your part, and I think that's in a lot of ways, that's fair, but we, I think it's an important thing to still uh, provide those RSCs and any accompanying explanations um, for how you got to uh, a cost and a risk reduction value based on, um, you know, it could be based on SME judgment or uh, any other number of sources. Uh, it's just, we also make a recommendation in the SMAP proceeding, um, the decision that was recently adopted for our 2007. 013, so you can look into that for ideas about how to apportion some of the, the cost of the foundational activities and then develop RCs. Uh, we'd also like you to um, <clears throat> come up with ways to, to identify mitigation and control activities that are both effective and efficient. Um, so the, the RC is good at obviously um, is a good method for develop of identifying those control and mitigation programs that are cost efficient. Um, so, sorry, Francisco, can you move to the next slide? Uh, so, what you end up with uh, sometimes are mitigation activities are, um, have a high RSC score, but a very uh, low level of um, effectiveness um, and, a, and a low cost. So you could end up with a lot of, I think the highest in um, the highest mitigation and control activity in this ramp happened to be in non HFTD settings. So what we did was come up with a preliminary way to identify uh, what we consider eff both effective and efficient using the median. So we took a look at risk reduction scores. We found the median point. We looked at all of the, all of the activities that um, exceeded the median on risk reduction scores. And then we looked at the um, RSC calculation and we looked at the, what the median value was. And then we looked at all of those activities that exceeded that median on the RSC score. And then we looked for those those uh, mitigations that had both a high, you know, relatively high uh, risk reduction and a high RSC score. And, and of the 48 control and mitigation activities, um, roughly 14 or so that met that criteria. So 
that's one idea for how SDG &E might want to consider uh, identifying those um, those particular. Sorry, Francisco, can you uh, move two sl one slide forward or two slides forward? One more. Uh, so you can look in the report and see uh, see uh, some a preliminary method for identifying both effective and efficient mitigation programs. Um, We'd also like SD, SDG and &E to come up with a different alternative than the one they provided in the report. One of the alternatives they provided said all undergrounding. We know that's not realistic uh, and we prefer that they investigate or offer a different alternative in time for the next filing, uh, the GRC filing. Um, and again, we provide ideas. Uh, REFCO came up as, as a potential alternative that you might wanna explore or at least um, Look into as a, as a as a proper alternative, or realistic alternative. Um, and then we also think SDG &E should consider separating the analysis of risk of PSPS impact from the wildfire risk. And the number of analyses that speak to the PSPS impact risk, we know safe like on a uh, according to the settlement agreement and the MAVF, you, you know PSPS impact by itself might not warrant. Uh, um, inclusion in the in the wildfire risk based on the safety score, but we do think that the PSPS impact should be included, if uh, but just separate from the wildfire risk. That way, you can come up with its its uh, its unique tranches for the PSPS impact versus the wildfire risk. And the example I'll I'll speak to is PSPS impact. Um, the important assets in the PSPS impact really are the customers, and so you can tranche based on the types of customers you're serving. And whereas wildfire risk, really it's the, it's the risk of equipment failure that and the assets related to equipment failure that you're, uh, you've identified in the tranching. So there's some differences there that would, might work better and speak to, uh, speak to the risk a little bit better if you were to separate them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then I'll take you through a couple of recommendations for SDG &E that are really about uh, clarity and transparency, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the uh, you know, when they read through your filings and your reports uh, when it comes to the risk of, of wildfire. Um, so the first one I'll mention is um, the drivers and triggers. Uh, they were numbered uh, in a way that was it, within your bow tie. It was numbered in a way that was. Uh, somewhat random from what I understand. Um, it doesn't order them according to your top concerns or priorities, nor does it provide any sort of uh, estimate as far as the frequency. And you can look at PG&E's PG ramp from last year. They have some ideas about um, ways in which you, you might want to present the drivers and triggers. Um, I know it's not a, it's not as clean as it, as, um, or the drivers and triggers not always as distinct as speaking to right now, but uh, I think, you know, you'll, the reader, the audience, uh, all interested parties would be best served by uh, so some identification of top concerns and priorities. Uh, there's also the lack of um, a quantification of your exposure to your assets and the wildfire risk and the customers exposed to the PSPS impact risk in the report itself. So you never quite say how many circuit miles are in the HFTD. You never talk about um, of circuit segments that are in total in the HFTD um, or areas of concern in the non-HFTD even, uh, or the types and numbers of the customers exposed to the PSPS impact risk. Um, I think that, that's a pretty easy uh, item to cover in your report and will put everyone or allow everyone to understand how much exposure you actually have to this risk. Um, another recommendation we come we uh, we included in this chapter um, is just a simple matter of presentation. Um, the wildfire risk core uh, in total seems lo is lower than the risk of PSPS impact core in total. Um, it's not until you break it down by tier that you realize there's the inclusion of the non HFTD that's weighing down the wildfire risk core score. So. There's there's a 
there's a preference on our end for you to show it uh, broken down by tier after you've discussed it in, uh, in the aggregate. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so additional recommendations for clarity include uh, any and all written justification uh, and explanations for your, the SME judgment. Uh, sometimes there was an effectiveness number uh, based on SME judgment, but no corresponding explanation as to how they came up with that or how they justified that element. Um, so we just wanna make sure that you, anytime SME judgment is covered, please include um, your explanation or their explanation, I should say. Um, and then another recommendation is uh, explain why the covered conductor control mitigation program has an effect on PSPS impact risk reduction in tier three. Somehow it wasn't, um, it didn't have an impact in tier two. Uh, it's not clear why or if that was a mistake even. So time for your next filing, please uh, go ahead and explain that issue. And then next slide, please. In this section, I'm going to throw it back to Ben. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, our, the, the second highest uh, San, uh, San Diego gas and electric risk was uh, electric infrastructure risk. Um, this chapter was uh, primarily written by uh, Marty Kurovich. Um, so our um, SDG describes the electric infrastructure integrity risk or EII risk as the risk of a failed asset outside of the high fire threat districts uh, in San Diego gas and electric service territory, resulting in an incident that impacts safety, reliability, potential liability, and stakeholder satisfaction. So the, uh, this risk was uh, kind of interesting and unique amongst um, the risks because the consequences score was pretty low, um, but the, uh, the, the incidents, the number of the likelihood of the events was pretty high. Uh, so for that reason, it resulted in um, in making a high priority uh, risk score in their risk register. Um, reliability was the primary um, and most important consequence, followed by stakeholder satisfaction. Uh, and as mentioned previously, the stakeholder satisfaction attribute is of, uh, from our perspective, of uncertain value. Um, so. Also, as mentioned earlier, the risk chapter also su suffers from a lack of tranche specific uh, pre mitigation risk scores. Uh, 14 of the 40 controls are labeled as uh, tranches, but uh, none have uh, different initial uh, risk scores. Um, and we, we flag this because, again, just to reiterate uh, something we mentioned earlier, um, as spelled out in the settlement agreement, uh, defining uh, a defining characteristic of a tranche, it should be a logical disaggregation of a group of assets, physical or human, or systems into subgroups with like characteristics as characteristics for purpose of risk assessment. So the uh, risk band efficiency must be determined at the tranche level using the distinct lower and core for each tranche. So sdg &E did not present distinct pre-mitigation risk scores uh, for the tranches, so that makes it harder for us to assess the uh, um, the value of the um, mitigations. So in other words, despite the distinct characteristics and risk drivers for the tranches, all of the EII tranches were given the same uh, pre-mitigation risk scores. Uh, and that's that's kind of in a nutshell. I mean, if we, uh, it's it, the critiques in this chapter um, corresponded to the overall, um, a lot of the overall uh, critiques. So we can uh, move on to the next slide, please. One, there we go. Oh, back one, sorry. So uh, the gas system risks. Uh, so for sdg &E, the third highest uh, risk score was high uh, pressure pipelines. And for SoCal gas, it was the uh, first highest uh, risk score. Uh, so again, with uh, with these risk chapters, which were primarily written by uh, Fred Haynes and uh, Gary Urban, um, uh, they they had the same the same kind of general issues, uh, methodological issues. Uh, the um, lower and core were not specific uh, to each tranche. Um, an example we mentioned earlier 
there's basically two tr broad tranches uh, with a lot of highly variable pipelines within each of those tranches. So the high, there's a high consequence area, which references uh, areas where pipelines pass through that uh, have uh, buildings that are intended for human occupation and other um, other characteristics as defined by FIMSA. And then the non high consequence area uh, tranches. But within each of those, they, there probably should have been multiple uh, tranches based on the characteristics of those uh, pipes. Um, we would have expected the risk scores to change based on uh, the variables uh, within these. Um, again, we uh, I also used this example earlier uh, for the vintage plastic uh, replacement. Uh, the analysis indicates that there is there's just a small number of the vintage plastic that covers uh, quite a bit of the risk, and we would have uh, liked to see that uh, divided up more uh, granularly. And then for uh, gas storage, um, there was a, we had the granularity issue there as well um, for the, tie, the the wells at the, the, the risk characteristics at Aliso Canyon versus Ana Rancho versus uh, I think Playa del Rey um, ha, are you know they have, or La, uh, La Galita have there's they're different facilities with different geological characteristics, uh, but the uh, the the wells were were lumped into uh, single tranches. Then um, we also uh, thought that even though you know probably based on all the upgrades and everything, the um, uh, the likelihood, even though the consequence of of an Aliso Canyon type of a blowout is really high, the likelihood is probably really small given the regulations um, uh, requiring that no single point of failure can result in an uncontrolled uh, release. Um, we we should we, we felt that it at least should have been brought up because I think readers who are looking at SoCal gases uh, risks um, would have an eye towards looking at uh, look for where Aliso Canyon is and how it's dealt with, uh, given how uh, the public interest, uh, the political interest, and the uh, uh, past uh, events that have occurred there, uh, we thought it should have been um, at least discussed, if not uh, quantified. Uh, so those are the uh, the gas storage risks. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, I believe Gary's on the call, but uh, as I mentioned, Fred is um, on vacation, uh, so we can uh, uh, try to answer questions, uh, but may need to do a get back to you kind of thing on on some of those issues uh, if something overly technical comes up. Uh, so with with that, that concludes our description of the uh, individual, the high, the, the top three risk. Uh, uh, from each of the uh, utilities. Uh, so we can uh, we go to the next slide. I'm just going to briefly discuss next steps, and then we can talk about whether we want to take a break now or uh, uh, start opening it up to uh, question and answers. So for um, next steps, the um, uh, written comments are going to be due uh, December 6th, uh, which is also, I believe it's the same day as our pre-filing workshop for uh, Southern California Edison's ramp. So we're like, wrapping this one up and starting immediately into uh, the new uh, ramp for uh, Southern California Edison, which will be filed uh, next year. Uh, the reply comments will be uh, due uh, December 15th. Um, and then um, uh, we will, uh, then, then Sempra will you know, go to work. Uh, uh, they probably already have uh, starting on their, uh, modifications uh, resulting from those um, uh, comments uh, in the SPD review. So uh, that, that concludes our uh, the formal elements of our presentation. So it is uh, now uh, 10, uh, 19, and our um, uh, agenda calls for um, a break at uh, 11. So we can either take a break now uh, or we could go straight into question and answers. Um, I'll turn it over to the group if uh, whoever speaks first can get their preferences uh, heard. And uh, Francisco, we can uh, we can take the uh, uh, the slides down unless folks need them for reference later. We, we will pop them up as needed, I guess, so we can see each other when we're talking. You can just take them down now. Thank you. Do I have a, a motion for a break or a motion for just plowing through and going into question and answers?
Oh, this is this is Tom from Turn. I'd be fine if we just continued. All right, let's do it. Uh, so, um, with that, then let's uh, let's just um, yeah open it up. Did anybody have does anybody have questions about either what we talked about today or something you saw in the uh, Sampra Ramp report? Everyone's very quiet today. Um, so this is this is Tom Long from Turn. Um, first, I wanted to commend all the folks at SPD for a, a very high quality report. Um, appreciate all your efforts on in fairly challenging and time compressed situation. Um, it's very readable and the, the analysis is clear and um, we agree with a lot of your uh, recommendations. I wanted to go back to the um, initial sort of general overview findings. We don't need to go to the slide, but um, I um, think we're we're in um, pretty strong agreement with most of those general findings that you made, um, particularly about the time period for the analysis, um, the issues about uh, tranche specific lower and core and uh, tranche granularity. Um, you're very much in agreement about those issues. And um, we appreciate that you um, highlighted the issue of the um, high levels of um, imputed values of st statistical life that um, result from the Semper Utilities construction of their MABF. Um, and as you noted, Ben, I think this is an issue that also um, was raised with, with respect to PG&E's um, MABF structure. Um, and for that reason, it su suggests that this probably would be a good issue to be just talking about. And I, it probably is on on the. I, I'm not integral. Uh, I'm not intimately involved with the SMAP two proceeding, but I, I suspect it's an issue that's that's going to be addressed there, and that's good. Um, I think it would be helpful to um, move toward greater um, consistency among the utilities. On, on the construction of these MAVFs, it's not clear why they need to be different, um, all that different. If, if, if there need to be any differences at all, it would facilitate comparisons among the utilities. Um, but with respect to your report, um, I like that you, Turn, Turn had made a recommendation for trying to bring the um, value of statistical life um, closer to the values that are used by federal agencies. Um, and we we proposed one way to do it. I like that you um, offered a different approach um, because it shows that there's not there are a variety of means there are a variety of sort of levers to to use to make the MAVF um, produce more reasonable imputed value of values of statistical life. So we'll be looking at that. Um, we've started. Thinking about that ourselves and in, in relation to PG&E's MAVF structure, um, so we'll be looking at that. But I, I think it's good that you open the door that there's a variety of different uh, different um, options that can be used. I, I will I will comment on one thing in the report. You say um, Turn had recommended that the safe that the 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 top value for the safety range. Um, be moved from 20 to 200, and that would that would yield a, a what we consider to be a more reasonable value of statistical life. Um, and as I say, that's one way to do it, not the only way. Um, your comment was that an increase in the range to 200 would push the consequence beyond the worst utility-related catastrophic fire Californians have ever experienced. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I think we slightly disagree with the. The reading of the MAVF principles that 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 yields that comment. Um, and I'm going to get a little into the weeds of the settlement agreement, but I'm I'm referring to row three of the settlement agreement, um, which I think is is sort of maybe what's behind that comment. And 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 that principle reads: each lower level attribute has its own range, minimum and maximum expressed in natural units that are observable during ordinary operations and as a consequence of the occurrence of a risk event. Um, and I think somehow that principle is getting sort of um, misread a little bit into thinking that the maximum 
has to be something that was already observed. Um, the top of the range has to be something that was already observed. When that's not what the the, the words say, it says observable. Um, and so it doesn't have to be based on historic levels. Um, and basically, the, it's the natural units that need to be observable. Um, so I, I don't know that we should be thinking about it in terms of you have to be able to justify the maximum as something that that was we've seen in the past. Um, it could be something that could be anticipated in the future. But the other thing to re remember is that these ranges are not set in caps. And I think that's another potential misconception. These are not caps because if if the the units exceed that maximum, they're still going to be counted toward um, the consequence score. So it's not a cap. It's just used to try to help construct the MAVF to yield reasonable values. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a way to set these values, the various you know levers we have to play with, the 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 the, the weights and the the ranges in a way that yields values that comport with our ideas of what of of, of what's reasonable. And value of statistical life is one of the helpful things to look at. So I just wanted to throw that out as, as as an alternative consideration. We'll talk about this in our comments as well, but I just thought that would be something that might be worth highlighting for if anybody else wanted to dis discuss that, that would be interesting to hear. Um, otherwise, um, I don't know that there's anything particular that we, we wanted to comment on this morning. Um, I would in, invite if, if Eric Borden from TURN had anything he wanted to say at some point, he should feel free, of course. Um, but I will um, yield the floor at this point. Thanks, Tom. Um, I see Chris Parks got his camera on. Joseph Mitchell's got his camera on. What do you guys want to speak up? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll uh, just respond quickly to what Tom just said regarding uh, the maximum values. Uh, in fact, we do not want to rely on historical precedent. Uh, what our contributions on power laws have shown is that for wildfires in particular and other types of uh, events following power law distributions, uh, historical values are significantly under predict future values. Uh, it will always get worse unless you do something about it. Uh, so in that sense, I think picking a a higher value rather than a lower is more representative of what we're going to be dealing with in the future. And uh, just re regarding the value of statistical life, uh, just everybody needs to keep in mind that this is this is uh, very subtle in its implications because wildfires are extremely expensive as disasters, and what that means is that. Uh, the average amount of dollars lost compared to the average life lost uh, is very large because people evacuate from fires, their houses don't, and their houses burn down. So when you do pick a lower value of statistical life, what that will naturally sh tend to do is reduce the uh, you know, safety or, or the overall risk impact coming from human life lost. So you need to be very aware of the implications as you do this. Uh, one thing we noted is that uh, the addition of smoke uh, seems very likely to substantially increase the health risks, uh, in fact, may dominate the health risks uh, for uh, wildfires in which case that will help to compensate for some of the uh, you know, suppression of, uh, of danger to human life uh, that using a lower uh, VL cell would, would cause. So uh, I'll yield the floor on that. Hey, this is Miles from uh, Cal Advocates. Um, I'll, 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 and I also wanted to express my support for uh, Tom's comment regarding row three of the settlement agreement. I mean, this is something that we've been looking into in various proceedings insofar as um, getting utilities to adequately quantify impacts from climate change. I mean, 
a power law type approach for wildfire is certainly a good way to do that as well as just not having a like having an adequate maximum consequence score and so yeah i i I, th I think tom's interpretation would lead to more of that and so yeah just thanks and thanks for that and just to just to clarify on <clears throat> on the um uh, the illustrated example of how you could do it. I think the main reason we did that was to um, just to, just like turn had one way of doing it. We just wanted to illustrate. You could we could have done it like you know 15 different ways or 100 different ways or something. We just wanted to illustrate that you could uh, the MAVF uh, framework uh, provides uh, a lot of latitude for utilities, and so it's just something that that um, the commission and parties and and IOUs need to be um, mindful of. So it wasn't like advocating of a specific way of doing it. It's just saying that, it, in fact, the recommendation just says Semper should take another look at this. Uh, Chris, did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. Tagging on to what Miles just mentioned, uh, Chris with uh, Cal with his. Um, yeah, um, I think we we support what Turn and MGRA were just mentioning about power law, not relying on historical um uh numbers to to uh to estimate risk going forward and so um i just wanted to you know chime in on that um and add on to what miles was just mentioning um and also i would add that um uh there's a lot of good stuff in this report um and uh it's a, a recurring theme i think is is granularity um uh the need for granularity um uh what Arnold mentioned earlier about uh, you know uh, uh, bringing bringing out the fact that uh, eighty percent of risk is 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 related to twenty percent of the uh, um, circuit segments. Uh, having that very clear because that's what I think can be used to drive the and prioritize the mitigation programs in the general rate case. I did have one question: is um, is there any and looking over the next steps? Will would there be any opportunity? I know Ben, you you mentioned just a little while ago that uh, perhaps uh, uh, utilities, or maybe it was uh, Arnold about that they may be working on some of this, or the utilities may be working on some of these comments uh, right now uh, to respond to them. Is there any um, uh, plan or or um, Opportunity for the utilities to uh, supplement uh, to respond to what uh, uh, this report has highlighted, so that that information can be brought forward in the near term as part of this ramp proceeding, uh, rather than just looking for it to come out in the general rate case. I mean, if there were, it would be great to to be able to have that. It would benefit us for the general rate case. As well as be able to understand what what uh, approach has been to address these comments. So, if that were something that could be um, uh, supplemented by the utilities uh, sooner than later, I think that we would definitely appreciate that. Uh, anyway, that was just I don't know if there's any plan for that, but that was sort of the question. Thanks, Chris. Um, we hadn't planned on um, a intermediary step between now and the uh, GRC outside of the comment process. Um, and I think that, like, as you alluded to at the end of your comment, I think it's going to be really challenging uh, to um, uh, just logistically um, for the utility to be able to provide opportunities for additional engagement uh, between now and, and their filing. What what I was thinking was going to happen would be something fairly similar to the way PG&E has handled it, where they um, uh, uh, made sub substantial revisions uh, to their uh, their risk framework uh, in when they filed their GRC, and they included um, a information um, like a like a table, basically saying, "Here's what folks said, and here's what we did," um, uh, kind of thing. Uh, in a very uh, transparent way of uh, demonstrating uh, the improvements and modifications they made to their uh, their general rate case. I don't know if um, if folks from Sampra want to respond uh, as well. Hey Ben, this is Joe. 
Can you hear Please me? Go ahead, Joe. Oh. There we go. Yes, uh, I think one of your recommendations was for, it might have been, I think, recommendation 10 for us within the GRC to address each of the findings and recommendations from yourselves and stakeholders within the GRC. And I, similar to yourself, I am envisioning something, uh, a table that identifies who had what finding and what recommendation and what our follow up is uh, all contained within the GRC. Thank you. Any other comments or um, or questions we can um, respond to or parties can respond to? If not, then um, we look forward to uh, um, you know seeing folks' comments and and reply comments and. Um, um, we can we can just leave this open for a while if folks want to uh, uh, chime in. Um, uh, Commissioner Hawk, did you want to uh, make any additional remarks or did you have any questions? No, I, I just appreciated the comments. Um, and anyone else has any before we end? But um, and thank you all um, for participating and for all your work on the report. Thank you. Okay, well, I, if if there aren't additional comments, I'm just going to leave it, uh, leave it. I'll just hang around for a bit. If folks want to, uh, um, uh, discuss, you know, the process or anything in our report. Um, uh, so we can stick around for another, uh, 10 minutes. Um, oh, oh Bill Steele is asking, will the presentation be available? Yes, it will. Uh, we will post uh, the recording and the PowerPoint, uh, on our website. I can, I can actually, um, uh, circulate the uh, PowerPoint to the uh, service list uh, uh, shortly. Okay, well, with that, uh, thanks everybody. And uh, I'll just hang around here for um, another 10 minutes or so um, if uh, folks want to uh, talk about anything. Thank you. Um, well, Ben, since we have time, uh, I did have uh, one question. This is Eric from Turn. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Go for it, Eric. Great. Um, yeah, I think it was a really excellent report as, as was reflected. Um, in my review, there was one issue that we brought up that I wasn't sure made it in, but it, it may have. Um, and this, again, goes to the granularity um, issue, uh, but another um, kind of view on granularity is program granularity. So, um, sometimes, you know, those, uh, a program will consist actually of multiple activities that are pretty dissimilar and have dissimilar costs, um, and stuff, um, where, you know, it's really helpful when you look at the RSC to see those activities actually broken out. Um, and so we, this is a short section of our informal comments, but ju just curious if, um, if you see it the same way where, you know, you want to make sure that, um, a quote unquote program if that consists of multiple different activities with different cost drivers. You, you want to make sure that those are, are, are broken out, um, independently. Arnold, do you want to take that question? Uh, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, um, the recommendation that we made in the report, I think, was more along, along the lines of um, that we weren't able to actually identify areas where there were multiple mitigations uh, because it wasn't um, sorted by the circuit miles or circuit segments. So we couldn't actually say for this risk profile, these activities affect uh, risk reduction. And so, but I think what you're driving at is that there is overlap in a given risk, 
risk reduction is isolated by like tier three, tier two, or, or location. And that risk reduction is going to sort of be generally to those locations as opposed to um, the specific assets and uh, affected by that mitigation. Does that sound accurate? I, I think that's right. I think even more basically though, sometimes a quote unquote program will involve like completely distinct activities, but because of how SDG has historically kind of tracked and done the program, uh, they'll kind of be lumped together. So, as an example, um, you know, we noted that the overhead system hardening program um, kind of sometimes it'll combine like pole replacements with um, conductor replacement with other type of asset replacement as well. Um, and, and I think we had a couple other examples there too. And so so even, um, and we didn't, this wasn't one that we even said, but in my prior work on, on veg -ish, vegetation management issues, um, you know, part of it will be trimming, but part will also be uh, tree removal, right? And those have very, they're, they're, they're different risk drivers that they're trying to capture usually. They're very different costs, um, and so that, that's just it's just another area of granularity that we don't always think about. Where program granularity, as in, you know, looking at, um, let's say, pole removal separate from the other things that are happening within the program, is is really important from an RSC perspective as well as like, if, for the commission to understand, you know, different RSCs and different risk mitigation potential of those. Varying components. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's actually um, while we yeah, I mean it does make sense. Um, I guess the general capture of more granularity would lead us or lead hopefully SDG SDG you need to maybe parse out those specific activities within the general activity. Um, I assume you're going to include that in your comment, right? Yes, we, yeah, we will for sure. Yeah, that it does make sense. We didn't get to that level of granularity or that level of recommendation, uh, you know, stopping short of certainly stopping short of to that level. But um, yeah, if you put in your comments, I think um, and enter it into the record, that would make okay. sense. Thank you. Did anybody else want to talk about that particular issue? Anybody on SPD staff want to raise that or talk about your observations or experience with it? experience with it. Hey Ben, I think we'll just uh we'll wait and make sure we fully understand we'll read the comments to make sure we fully understand uh Eric's position. Sounds good. Any other um questions or comments? All right, well, I'll just, I'm just going to hang out here then uh, for uh, another 5 minutes or so um, and. Uh, well, um, if you, if anything occurs to you, please, uh, please uh, speak up. Hey, this is Miles from a Cal Advocate. So since we have the time, I do have another question, um, mainly for SPD staff. Um, I'm honestly sort of wondering, I mean, the WINGS model that uh, SDG&E provided was certainly a novel approach. I don't think we've really seen something like that before in, ter or in terms of trying to incorporate the PSPS risk into the fire risk. I mean, admittedly, I haven't had that much chance to dive into the report yet, but I guess I'm just sort of wondering for you all, like, what were your sort of overall thoughts 
as to that approach. I mean, I guess I'm just sort of wondering if you could give just a brief overview of your thoughts and like ways that it could be improved, I guess. Arnold, or uh, we have uh, we have Wendy Al McDonald on the phone or on the call too. Um, Steve, anybody want to take a take a shot at that? Uh, my general my general thought on that is it's very general so far because I don't. I'm sorry, know. I momentarily stepped away to take care of something. What was the question again? Oh, I was just asking about SPD's thoughts on the wings model. Uh, no, I, I don't have um, much thoughts on it. I will defer to uh, Arnold. So, so my my general th my general thoughts on that were basically I, I was I, I think it opens up a lot of opportunity to uh, identify specific circuit segments and risk profiling, risk profiling based on. Um, uh, on, a, on a very, very, very uh, uh, granular scale, um, the opportunity to do risk quantiles and look at it, before, take a portfolio approach on risk. Um, I, I'm, 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 I've come away impressed. I don't know how, you know, the interveners feel or, uh, or other utilities might feel about that, but I, I think the circuit segment analysis, especially as it relates to the PSPS impact, really lets us like hone in on um what segments need work and 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 to what extent um they need sort of mitigation against uh various elements i, I just um i mean I, I i don't know i'm not as well versed in the underlying uh, method for how they identify the various risks for each segment but sort of as a general more general note uh I, i'm pretty impressed by that level of analysis and i think it'll open up doors for Really, really detailed uh, and targeted uh, solutions or mitigation solutions or mitigation and solutions. I mean, I'll just say from Turn's perspective, I think we thought the wings model, use, incorporating that into the ramp analysis, was a a good, a, 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 a very much a step in the right direction. Um, and I see Eric's popped up, he may have some um, more focused comments, but um, I think one of the concerns we had is that it wasn't carried through for the entirety of the wildfire risk analysis, that it wasn't being used to establish asset-based tranches um, for the entirety of the analysis to, to use, uh, to, to, to make pre-mitigate, to do pre-mitigation scoring. Um, so it was sort of it sort of was deployed kind of halfway and only partially for the wildfire analysis. Um, so it it was a good a good step. It's a good step, and um, we we hope it can be built upon. Eric, did you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, no, I I agree with all that. Um, I had one other uh, thought. Oh, it, it was also um, we noted it was also only used to scope. Um, cover conductor and undergrounding um, rather than, you know, which I do think will be most of their wildfire spent. So, but um, for example, like vegetation management will also have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of dollars and a lot of miles. Uh, and so we'd like to see that granular analysis applied. And I will say, um, I don't have this in mind, but even it's not quite a circuit segment level. Um, some of the segments were actually pretty long, I think like up to 30 miles or something. Um, whereas I've seen analysis from Edison in the previous uh, rate case, it wasn't quite the same thing, but it was a risk analysis that really was at like a segment level, um, like, you know, even less, much less than a mile for, for many of them. Um, and so I, I think it's a really good start and could be made even more granular um, to get to, even if it's not segment, you know, but several miles or something like that, um, because risk, wildfire risk in particular um, is, tends to be so uh, heterogeneous across, across the territory. And you see that as you get more and more granular with it. 
Yeah, my, my understanding is that this, this is just the beginning um, of the analysis, right? Where uh, I don't know, I know that at the time of the ramp report filing, it had roughly 108 circuit segments that they did some work or analysis on, but um, I don't know where they are today. I don't know if Joe wants to answer that. But, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it seems like uh, it's been moving rapidly along and there's a lot of opportunity there, like you guys were saying. Thanks, Arnold. Melinda yeah. Dickinson. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just real ahead, quick say that yes, uh, we are progressing. Uh, I think just what's important for everyone to understand is that is, as we've mentioned during the workshops, uh, we've been focusing on building the models spe uh, for specific applications, and it's not always as straightforward to uh, incorporate the existing model for other assets, meaning we have to make modifications to the model as applicable for other assets. And so then as the model is developing, we certainly plan on using it for other assets, but we appreciate everyone's understanding that there is time associated with doing that. Melinda. Yeah, thank you. This is Melinda Dickinson from Protect Our Communities and Overall, there's some really great information and recommendations in this report. So thank you guys for doing such a thorough job. Um, I do have one one question. It, it seems that uh, I, I I think that many of the topics were addressed, but I I wanted to confirm. It looks like the SPD evaluation is treating the um, the 2019 filing as kind of like a non-issue, just from the language in on page four, but I wanted to confirm, did you guys go through um, the the comments that were made in that report or, or take that into consideration? Um, because D2009004 does require that, that the 2019 ramp report feedback be um, addressed in the 2021 ramp report. And one of our concerns is that it wasn't uh, adequately done, uh, but I wanted to confirm that that specific issue is not addressed in the in the SPD evaluation, or did I miss it? You know, I'm not sure. Um, Fred, the project manager, uh, may very well have um, reviewed that. Um, what what was the issue that was raised? In those well, there were, there was a, a lot of there were there were many issues raised, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything in the SPD evaluation. It does say on page four that um, Sempra it, it, it implies you say Sempra's 2021 ramp is their second effort, excluding the 2019 filing, which was dropped due to the change in the rate case plan schedule and uh, blah blah blah. I just wanted to so that that implies to me that the um, 2019 filing and the comments made in the 2019 proceeding were not specifically addressed in the ramp report, although I think a lot of the issues were were naturally addressed just in responding to the 2021 report, but not, not all of them. And so I haven't gone through and determined which ones were and which ones aren't weren't addressed quite yet, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't under I wasn't misunderstanding a um, that a, there wasn't a piece of the SPD evaluation that I was missing in terms of um, the requirement of D twenty oh nine oh four that the comments from the twenty nineteen ramp report be incorporated into the uh, twenty twenty one ramp report. So we didn't append those to this report. Um, and certainly some of the same staff who were working on the um, uh, this ramp report were involved in evaluation of the uh, prior one before it was um, the plug was pulled on it. Uh, but I'd have to, I'll have to check with Fred and get back to you on uh, whether or not the, uh, the comments in the prior submittal were explicitly considered uh, when we were doing uh, the ramp. Okay, and if not, um, I mean, we'll be addressing them in our comments. So I just wanted to make sure I was understanding. Uh, but it, overall, good job, you guys. Really, really well done. Thank you. Appreciate that.
Are there any other comments or questions uh, before we close out? Okay, not hearing any. Um, I'm gonna uh, like uh, folks can just drop off just just for the purposes of allowing for adequate public engagement. I'm just gonna turn off my video and mute myself, but I'll just hang around for another few minutes. Uh, and if something does come up, please speak up. Otherwise, uh, thank you everybody, and um, we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm going to hang around for one more minute till 11, and then we'll uh, call it a day. So uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to call it a call it a workshop and uh, please feel free to uh, give me a call or uh, reach out to me if you uh, have any questions about uh, the ramp report. Um, and uh, other than that, um, 
look forward to your comments and everybody have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Take care. All right, you too. Uh, happy, uh, happy holidays, everybody. Hope you have a good uh, time off. Thanks.